right. Uh, thank you all for, for, for logging in. And it's quite an honor to um, be asked to give this, this lecture in honor of Larry Ernst. He was a, a, a good friend, a, a, a fine statistician, and he showed his wisdom by, as far as I know, uh, never getting involved in the decennial census. So um, smart guy. Um, before I start actually talking, a series of disclaimers. All views expressed here are my own and do not necessarily those of the Census Bureau or the American Statistical Association or the ASA Census 2020 Task Force. Nothing I say should be taken as a criticism of the professional staff of the Census Bureau who have done amazing work under unbelievable pressure. All conclusions are subject to change as more information is available. And today's talk will focus on the process and does not attempt to evaluate the 2020 Census. So what I'm going to talk about is the why, who, what, and what not. Why? Why do we evaluate the census? Well, one simple answer, and this is a, a quotation from at least as close as I can remember from uh, Director Vince Barraba, the census isn't about anything important except money and power. Is it all showing up OK and people hearing OK? All yes. Right. Okay, good. Um, just just double checking. You could, gets... you could put your slides in presentation mode. Please. It didn't work for some reason. Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, yeah, for, it worked on Friday, but not today. You know, that's software, isn't it? Um, but just because it's important doesn't mean um, people evaluate it. And I love this quotation from the census director in 1939. The foreign phenomena of deliberately lying to the census enumerator or, and of hiding individuals or whole families is almost totally absent, even in the slums of our large cities. So as late as 1939, the director was pretty much uh, saying there was no such thing as an undercount. What changed? Well, Daniel Price in the 40s compared the 1940 census with the uh, 1940 uh, uh, draft registration, and he showed un undeniably two things, one of which was there was an undercount that is, people were being missed, but also this was disproportionately affecting uh, the, the minority population, the black population. And it's really the, the change from this is sort of a general, you know, you can't do everything perfectly to we're doing it much worse for the minority population that really changed this. Then, then came demographic analysis, which is a comparison of the, the census results to the results of birth, death, and estimates of registration and, and also um, estimates of Im immigration and emigration. And I brought, there was a series of these starting in 1950, but I brought up the 1991. And you can see from this slide, this is the net undercount. And for non-black females, and the reason it's black and non-black is just the way the birth registration was done for 100 years. Um, the undercount is pretty close to zero. It, it bobs around, but it, it's it's pretty trivial. For non-black males, it's you know not a little bit bad here uh, for young adults, but you know not bad. For non for black females, it, it starts high for children and adult and 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 and, and, and youth. Uh, it bounces around. It's five percent. That's not good, but not bad. But then for black males, starts high. And then, at least in the 90s, it was unbelievably high for the adult black male. Between 10 and 15 percent were missed. This changed census uh, undercount from an academic um, interest of you know scholars and, and, and demographers kind of liked it to a civil rights issue. How can you enforce the Voting Rights Act, the Civil Rights Act, the Housing Rights Act, all of these things when when you're missing huge percentage of the minority population? So this is what really changed it. And, and made it uh, a, a real issue. Beyond the sort of general reasons we have to evaluate the census, uh, there are unique challenges for the 2020 census. Uh, before COVID, uh, there are citizenship questions, uh, the whole controversy there, which eroded public trust. Not only uh, were the Republicans saying, uh, you can't trust the census, but many advocacy groups were saying, you can't trust the census. And there was a great uh, a presentation by uh, uh, Terry Sullivan in the, 19, in the 2019 uh, JSM, which has been reproduced in the Harvard uh, Science uh, Statistical Science Review, Data Science Review, 
on the general political climate with many dis discussions. Um, then, as we know, the data collection uh, was interrupted because of coronavirus. There was a postponement of the non-response follow-up, which also then ran into hurricane season and wildfire season. Wildfire season. Uh, there was administrative uh, inferences in the lawsuits, frequent changes of schedules. I was involved. There's a little bit of disclaimer. I was a witness for one of the one of the groups suing the census. We're suing the Commerce Department. Uh, specifically on on the schedule, and then the post uh, collection process was drawn out with issues of duplicates, group quarters, etc. And uh, there is a new and um, not I would say not fully tested, certainly not untested, uh, new pr privacy protection methods. The first use of differential privacy in the census, uh, and the final approval of the production uh, version was June 9th of 2021. Uh, so that's how uh, recent the final version was approved. Some unique questions for 2020. Uh, group quarters quality. Uh, the enumeration of group quarters was especially difficult because both of the delayed timing uh, and the reluctance of some institutions to share information. Uh, the quality of the admin uh, administrative data enumerations a Census Bureau has used a, a, a group a administrative data for decades, uh, but this really was the first extensive use, the first real big use of administrative records. Uh, how well did it work? And we now, as I mentioned, we have the new privacy protection methodology and how well will that meet user needs? And finally, and this is in green, uh, the effect of political interference on decision making and we'll leave that to the historians. I hope, you know, I assume that Margot Anderson is already writing her next book on this, but um, I, I, I'm not qualified to talk about it. So that's the why. What? Part one. Three dimensions of census quality. Statistical accuracy. We as statisticians like that. Numerical accuracy and distributional accuracy. How well are the numbers? How well are the percentages by small area? But there's also legitimacy, uh, the acceptance by the American population, what people consider, quote, an actual count. The Census Bureau has repeatedly stated its goal for 2020 was to, quote, count each person once, only once, and in the right place. That really is a question of legitimacy, and that's, that's their stated goal. Both are important, but are distinct and need to be assessed separately. And I will give a couple of extreme examples here. If the Census Bureau missed 25% of the population in each area, but counted 25% of the population twice, it would have numeric accuracy, but would lack legitimacy. If the Census Bureau missed exactly half the population in each state, the apportionment would be exactly the same as with a complete count, perfect distributional accuracy, but would, I would argue, lack legitimacy. More on the what. Census quality is more than national averages. I mean, the reason we take a census is geographic distribution and race and ethnic distribution. And assessing the census, one has to think about geographic distribution and race ethnic distribution. Second, and you know, I spent most of my career on, on, on coverage, but census quality is more than data collection. It includes unduplication, imputation, editing, privacy protection, dissemination, documentation, and trust. All of that is part of the data quality. And trust is hard to gain and easily lost. This is a headline from the Washington Post uh, about a month ago, Commerce Department Security Unit involved in counterintelligent operation, Washington Post, they found. And who are they investigating? People that criticized the census. Um, this, is, this, this is not the way to build trust. Um, enough said about that. Who? Who's evaluating the census? Well, um, it should come as no surprise since the Census Bureau. Census Bureau has had a long process of evaluating itself, certainly starting with the first post enumeration survey in 1950, um, in spite of uh, what, what the director, the earlier director said. Census Bureau really has a history of being evaluating itself and telling the public about itself. It's one of our proudest traditions. It also gave me employment for many, many years. 
The Census Bureau has a landing page here, 2020 Census Data Quality, that you can go in and it uh, what they did to ensure quality, operational metrics, outside reviews, news releases, blogs, reference maps, all there as, as it's produced, it's put up there. And this is just an example. Uh, here's an example of a, a, a blog post by Michael Bentley, a fine statistician, about uh, some of the operational me measures, a detailed discussion. And then there's there's maps and, and, and other metrics that you can go in and look at. So the Census Bureau really is, is out front in trying to um, show the quality of the census. Well, the National American Statistical Association, the task for has set up a task force on the evaluation of the 2020 census quality. This was set up actually before the election back, I believe, in September, October, um, when the census was in, in numerous lawsuits uh, going back and forth. I probably should do a census of census lawsuits. Uh, and, this, and the census, the American Statistical Association set up a task force with um, a group, and I was quite literally honored to be asked to be part of this, this unbelievably uh, talented group. Nancy Potak, uh, Bob Santos, Connie Citro, Bob Fay, Bob Groves, Sunshine Hooglis, Tom Lewis, Ken Pruitt, Denise Ross, Mac Snip, John Thompson and Kathy Wallman. I mean, an unbelievably talented group, um, plus me. Um, when he was nom nominated as director uh, for the Census Bureau, Bob Santos had, to, re had to, to resign from the task force, obviously. And Ken Pruitt has been appointed a special advisor to the census, so he had to, to withdraw as well. So this is the group. Uh, the group put out a, a early report uh, months ago and uh, this is before any of the data were available. Just sort of what 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 should we expect? Uh, indicators should be readily available and used expeditiously to assess the quality of the 2020 census. Qualified external researchers should be granted access to the data to help conduct the analysis. Additional assessments should be conducted when more data become available. Early planning for the 2030 census should build on the lessons from 2020, be conducted in public, and include extensive state, stakeholder input. Census is authorizing statute, Title 13, U.S. Code should be updated. Well, as part of giving uh, outside researchers access, the ASA Task Force set up a, a working group. This working group includes uh, Paul Beamer, Bob Fay, uh, Joe Salvo, and Jonathan Auerbach. And they are working closely with the Census Bureau to develop a set of state and uh, track level uh, quality indicators. Uh, Paul, Bob, and Joe all have special sworn status, so they are able to go behind the firewall and look at, at, at the, the, the data uh, before it goes uh, through privacy protection. And so um, they're working away with the Census Bureau to develop their metrics. Another group looking at the census is the National Academy of Sciences, uh, their, its Committee on National Statistics. The CNSTAT is conven convening a consensus panel to evaluate the 2020 census and make recommendations uh, for the 2030 census. It will review information from the Census Bureau on data collection, as well as various process measures and indicators of data quality obtained as part of the 2020 census evaluation. It will also look at other information, such as the results from demographic analysis, process measures, preliminary results from the PES, post enumeration survey, and the analysis of administrative records, and then compare these results from the evaluation of similar indicators from 2010 and 2000. And then outside researchers are looking at this. Uh, this is just a publication I, that, that popped up. I, I don't assess its quality one way or the other or say it's particularly insightful. It, it's just simply an example of research up to done at Harvard on the impact of the disclosure avoidance system on redistricting and vo voting rights analysis. There's a whole back and forth on this issue in, in the academic literature. Then, of course, the courts, the courts, the courts. 
uh, I say two current cases, but since I, I actually added a third, uh, the Urban League case uh, out in California on April 22nd, the court, the court agreed to dismiss the case, but under the terms of the dismissal, the Census Bureau is obligated to produce metrics about the quality of the upcoming 2020 census data releases and hold public briefings about those metrics. Alabama has sued, supported by 16 other states, uh, about the differential privacy uh, methodology. And then this is the one I just added, Fair Lines America Foundation, which is closely associated with the National uh, Republican Redistricting, uh, has filed a Freedom of Information Act re uh, request on how the Census Bureau counted group living quarters. And finally, I'm not going to say a lot about this, but sort of the final word is going to be data users. Uh, how, how, how well do the data fit their needs? And as they use the data over the next few years, uh, we, I'm sure we'll hear from them about whether they're pleased or, or, or not. And um, notice, even though I've been retired for over two years, I still use we. Um, that's just a habit of 40 years. OK, what? Well, there's uh, three major, in my mind, uh, evaluation projects. First, the process indicators, self-response rates, whole person imputation rates, proxy enumerations, duplicates, uh, duplicates eliminated, and some comparison with 2010. I'm going to talk about that in a moment. Demographic analysis, as I said, that's where you take uh, the birth registration, death registration, and then estimates of immigration and estimates of emigration and figure out how many people should be there. The, the first set was the set was released back in December, well before the census. This gives us the net national undercount by age and sex. It also gives us black, non-black, and recently it gives us estimates of the undercount uh, for Hispanic. So, uh, uh, and it gives us the time series, and also the post enumeration survey, essentially a follow-on survey matched one for one with the census to see the omissions, but also a follow-on survey. Uh, of, of, of a census to see how many erroneous inclusions. So this survey is needed for the net undercount, um, but also for omissions and duplications. In other words, this is the, the one survey that should give us whether the Census Bureau met its stated goal of once, only once, and in the right place. Um, it's needed for distributional accuracy. Demographic analysis does not give us that. And I think early, we should get results in early 20, uh, uh, 2022. Some examples of process indicators, percentage enumerated by proxy, excluding vacant and non-existent housing units, percentage of enumeration with pop count only, percentage enumerated using admin records, percentage uh, missing critical information, such as name, uh, date of birth, or race, ethnicity, percentage of addresses in the entire uh, non-response universe, including vacant and non-existent units uh, obtained by closeout in proxy, uh, although with vacant units, you would expect them to be proxy. Um, percentage of addresses that were left unresolved after data collection and processing concluded. This is a slide I, I, I borrowed. I didn't sleep, steal it. I borrowed from, from Ron Jarman's PA, uh, PAA talk about a month ago, where he shows the, um, some of the results some of the, uh, from, from the 2020 uh, census. And um, let me sure to point, out, point out a few highlights on this. Uh, first, if you look at the very top line, highest quality data, I think everybody agrees is what was self-reported online by mail by phone. This is where people voluntarily and quickly send back the information. And 2020 uh, did better than 2010 with 65%, uh, a big improvement. And I think that shows uh, the uh, importance of, of the uh, internet options. Uh, but now then the comparisons get really complicated because um, re preferred interview with the household respondent was much lower in 2020 than 2010, because 2020 had two new methods that we did not have 2010. And this is going to really complicate how to uh, compare the two. First, as I've mentioned, uh, 2010, 
I mean, 2020 has used extensively used admin records, almost 5%. And um, 2010 didn't. How well those worked um, is something that needs to be evaluated. And then 2020 actually went in and unduplicated uh, the census. So at the end of, of the process, 2010 only had four tenths of a percent uh, needing uh, imputation, unresolved addresses needing imputation. Well, in 2020, it's 9%. Oh my gosh, that's much, much worse. But how much of that is because 2010 didn't bother to look for duplicates, didn't matter to remove duplicates, and actually the 2020, by getting rid of the duplicates, by being more honest uh, with what's going on, is an improvement, although an improvement which makes the data uh, at the very at surface level uh, look worse. So this is, this is going to complicate um, comparisons between the two. OK, now this is my own opinion. Various things, um, limitations and questions, what not. Uh, challenges for process indicators, as I've been, talked about several times, new processes for 2020, um, admin records, the unduplication, how, did the, how well did those work? There's nothing to compare uh, from 2010. And also uh, possible limitations on the availability of the process indicator data uh, due to the new privacy protection rules. In other words, privacy protection, you know, it's not just the, the, the data data, but also the para data. And it's un unclear how much of this will be able to, will able, uh, census bureaus will be willing and able to release. Uh, there's discussion back and forth with the Census Bureau and, and groups, outside groups on this, and, and it has not been fully resolved, I don't think. Limitations to demographic analysis. Uh, increased complexity of race, ethnicity, uh, categorization. Remember, uh, Demographic analysis gives us black, non-black, and Hispanic. When it started back in 1950, virtually the whole country, I think close to 99% could be classified as either black or non-black, I mean black or, or white. And the some other race population was like less, well, much less than one half of 1%. Uh, so that makes it harder to to really interpret uh, with a more with the growing some other race population with the mark, mark more than one race option. It's really going to be harder to interpret. And the census race and ethnicity data has yet to come, so we don't really have those comparisons yet. Uh, difficulty in measuring undocumented immigration during the most recent census, most recent administration. I meant to say, uh, really. It's hard enough to, to, to come up with good estimates of the undocumented population, but if their participation in, most importantly, the uh, American Community Survey uh, changes rapidly, uh, that's going to be a real challenge for demographic analysis to really interpret that. And I don't really know, perhaps uh, unexpected movement of US citizens. Um, not sure how that's going to affect either the census or DA. Uh, but if they moved, if they lived outside the country in March, but moved in in early April, they should not have been counted. Limitations to the post enumeration survey, uh, because of COVID and other things, uh, the PES fieldwork was greatly delayed. In 1990, um, the, the fieldwork started in June and went through September. Remember, the PES fieldwork is asking people where they lived in April because of uh, various limitations, most importantly COVID. In 2020, the field work started in September and went through March of 2021. Exclusion by design of group quarters population. I don't know about this, but potentially large numbers of census records, lasting name, and other information necessary for accurate matching. I don't have that data, but it's something that we will need to be assessed. And limited ability. Uh, to assess the quality of admin records. Not zero ability, but it's, I don't think it's going to give us all the answers, uh, just be the way the dual system estimate methodology works. Census content, the Census Bureau conducted a re-interview studies for every census from 1950 to, 19, to 2010, but none was planned uh, for 2020. Now, a few other things. Uh, avoid circular arguments 
or independent estimates need to be estimate, need to be independent. The Census Bureau, before the census, back in December, put out three demographic analysis estimates, completely independent because the census wasn't in yet. A high one of uh, 335 million and a low one of 330 million. Uh, totally independent estimates. The census came in between the uh, middle and the low. Now, if you assume, if you start with the assumption the census is accurate, then you can conclude that probably the high is too high uh, compared to this census, which you're assuming is accurate. Uh, and then probably, you know, the middle or the low are the more likely to have been the accurate. Uh, and of course, then if you say the middle and the low are most likely to be accurate, why the census falls right between the two, that's pretty darn good. Um, Barring another of, of, of Ron Jarman's PAA talks, where he's got up here, you can see the, 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 the DA estimates. Oh, I didn't mean to move those around. Uh, I didn't know I could. Um, and the census. And he concludes the 2020 census count falls between the low DA and the middle DA ser series with the estimate of net coverage for the low series being 0.22% suggesting an undercount, an overcount, and the estimate for the middle series of minus 0.35 suggesting an undercount. In other words, because they because it was farthest away from the census, um, we don't need to think about the high DA estimate. Um, so now actually we no longer have three independent estimates. We have three dependent estimates. We have the census, and you've chosen the middle and the low because of how the census came in. They're, they're no longer independent. Another, and this is a little bit more subtle uh, and, and probably not as, as, as overt, uh, the 2020 uh, POP estimates are pretty much completely, were, were, are, are constructed independently of the census. Um, and part of just evaluating the POP estimates uh, the, these are, say, starting with 2010 and going forward, is comparing them with the, the next census. And it, the, the, the difference is something demographers have looked at for decades and decades called the error of closure. And it's been around for just about every census. Now, critics of the census say, look, look, the census is away from the POP estimates in a couple states. Uh, it must be the census that's wrong. Um, of course, it might be the POP estimates are wrong. They're amazing uh, uh, pop, uh, process, amazing set of estimates, but they are a set of estimates. On the other hand, the Census Bureau says, look how close we are to POP estimates. Uh, census must be right. But remember, part of census processing was comparing the census to the POP estimates. That's just, and, and, and wisely so, and, and reconciling any differences. So although these estimates were produced pretty much independently of census, the census was not produced independently of the POP estimates. Whoops, I can't do that. Finally, don't assume that because errors are hard to measure, they are negligible. Uh, for example, group quarters enumerations. In the past, remember, demographic analysis includes uh, group quarters. PES does not include group quarters. To compare the two, in the past, we just assumed group quarters enumeration was spot on. Just, just assume zero undercount for that, and, and you can reconcile the two. I'm not sure if that's um, uh, wise. Um, I don't know how good the administrative records were. I hope they're good. We did a lot of research. I can say we, because uh, I was still part of the group doing some of the research going into it, proudly to have been a small part of that. Uh, but we yet do not know how it came out. And race and ethnicity reporting, which is need, needed for redistricting, uh, we don't know how well that, that uh, matched up. So uh, two conclusions. Um, don't expect a simple answer. I suspect, uh, well, I'm pretty sure this was not a failed census. And back in, in the middle of COVID, you know, uh, and, among, and among other things that the previous administration was doing, um, that looked to some people like a real possibility. No, it, it, it's probably greater than a failed census. Uh, is it the best census ever? Well, I should have maybe put a less than or equal sign there, uh, but perhaps it wasn't the best census ever. Uh, where in the middle it falls, 
that's where we're going to evaluate it. But it's not going to be an A, B, C, thumbs up, thumbs down. It's going to have a lot of nuance to based on which aspects of census reporting, uh, census accuracy are most important uh, uh, to the user and the, and and and, um, and and analysts. Finally, I was taught uh, through a almost apostolic succession by the people that you know were taught by the people who were taught. So the people that taught me how to do a census were the ones that worked on the 1940, uh, 50, 60, and 70 census. And they used to like to say, taking a census is like watching a bear ride a bicycle. It's not that he does it so very well, it's that he was able to do it at all. And I think however the evaluation of 2020 comes out, uh, looking back at the um, Looking back at, at at where we were, looking back at the unbelievable amount of work uh, the census staff had to do, to and, and and not just hard work but innovative work, thoughtful work, um, uh, to 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 save the census and and make it as good as it is, um, even if it perhaps perhaps it's not the greatest census ever, it's certainly, I'm willing to say, the best pretty darn close to the best sense as possible for 2020. And that's the end of my talk. Shall I leave my slide up or stop sharing, uh, Alan? Well, I, I like the look of the bear myself. Great talk, Howard, really Thank very you. informative. Uh, and uh, I think Jeff is going to handle any questions that have come up in the chat, is that right? So, so there, there have been no questions on on the in the chat box, uh, but uh, we will take questions. Just remember to unmute yourself if you want to ask a question. So it's hard because there are so many uh, interesting points. Know what the challenge you're asking about. Howard, what's the, what's the the biggest question that you have about the census, the 2020 census? Um, well, I think the one the, the 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 most important one looking forward is how well the administrative records worked. I mean, sort of there was uh, for for years and years and years, people said, well, you know, we'll always use administrative records for the next census and then the next census. And this time, because because of a good planning. And, and and be of course the the necessity of, of the COVID, uh, we really got it to use them. And for 2030 and 2040 and 2050, um, knowing how well that worked, I think is much more important than assessing something that might have a unique uh, shortcoming uh, because of COVID. Um, Maybe admin rec maybe group quarters weren't as good as they should have been because of COVID. As they sent all the college students home before census day, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, that's a passing uh, phenomena. But admin records, how well did that work? I think it's going to be a roadmap uh, for the future of census taking. So that's if I had one to have one answer, that would be the answer. Can can you give some examples of what what constitutes the administrative records? You may have said something about this. Um, well, I think there um, and 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 other people on the line may may know more what would actually happen. But in general, the Census Bureau gets from uh, the IRS, Social Security, and various other federal agencies um, together with. Uh, records of, of, of where people live. And then we have the records from the American Community Survey and other surveys we take. Uh, we merge them. And if we have a good reason to believe um, that, say, these three people are consistently reported at this address, but for several reasons, they don't answer the census, they don't mail it back. And when we knock on their door, they don't answer it, then we can use that information to, to plug it right into the census and not go back again and again and again and again, um, or maybe settle for a proxy or, or, or the mailman or whatever, uh, and have the potential of getting a much more accurate count uh, of the census than is possible through, through you know, repeated callbacks, proxies, and proxies sometimes is, you know, the neighbor who really, the nosy neighbor who knows everything, 
And sometimes it's the postman who said, I just walked down the street and I haven't seen anybody here. Um, or, or, or I think three people live here not knowing that it's their, their vacation home. Um, so I think that's how they used it. Also, the other thing they used the administrator records for, I believe, is if they didn't, nobody mailed it back and we had administrative records that never showed anybody at that address, um, then you know we didn't have to follow up and knock on the door and, and verify the vacant, which by you know by by June might actually be occupied and save a lot of money and time. And, and of course, with COVID, a lot of very important money and time uh, by just saying, "Yep, they didn't mail it back," because from what we know, uh, nobody lives there. Are there, are there other questions? If not, I want to thank How Howard again for a great, great talk. Really. And thank, thank you for inviting me and and letting me part of this um, this 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 session honoring Larry. I'm going to stop sharing now. Okay. Back to you, Alan. All right. Thank you. Um, so we're we're going to shift gears a little bit uh, and. Um, to, we have two speakers uh, to uh, reminisce about uh, their uh, days and work with Larry. The uh, first is, uh, that, that, and that will be Pat Cantwell and Stephen Cohen. Um, Pat will t talk first. He's the uh, chief of the Decennial Statistical Studies Division at the United States Census Bureau. And over 30 years, he's worked on household surveys, business surveys, uh, decennial census of population housing and the economic census uh, and he says early in his career he worked with larry ernst on household surveys especially the current population survey so uh, pat why don't you uh, take over thank you alan and uh, i just add my uh, word to howard uh, what an uh, excellent and interesting presentation uh, good afternoon I'm delighted to say a few words about Larry Ernst's contributions while employed at the Census Bureau. All of Larry's efforts went to solve real practical problems. Here are just a few topics that Larry researched and wrote papers on while at the Census Bureau. Controlled rounding and controlled selection, adjusting for influential values and in surveys, maximizing and minimizing overlap in consecutive samples. Many issues for redesigning surveys are reselecting their sample various problems and variance estimation, numerous topics involving the current population survey. I could go on and on. And Larry's interests went beyond surveys. He published a paper on apportionment methods for the House of Representatives in the subsequent court challenges and testified at trial. In fact, as far as I know, he was the authority in the mathematics of the various options for apportioning the seats in the House. I'll speak more about two areas in which his contributions were extensive. First, I'd like to highlight Larry's success employing linear, program, linear programming in a special application, the transportation problem, to optimize procedures for taking surveys and disseminating their results. His aptitude here was how to structure a survey problem in terms of an objective function and its constraints. Early in his career, Larry worked with Larry Cox applying the transportation problem to controlled rounding. Rounding is used to disseminate data in specified table format, but it has also been used to provide disclosure protection to survey respondents. With conventional rounding, one usually rounds to the number, the number that's nearest to the, to the nearest integer or $1,000 or whatever specified. But conventional rounding doesn't guarantee that marginal totals in the grand total in a table are maintained. Controlled rounding maintains these totals, but allows one to round up or down rather than only to the nearest integer. The problem then becomes finding the solution that minimizes the rounding error under the constraints of the totals. In 1982, Larry Ernst and Larry Cox proved that solutions to the controlled rounding problem in two dimensions always exist, and they provided a feasible solution. Their work is still cited today. Later, Larry Ernst, demonstrated by providing a counterexample that their two-dimensional results do not generalize to three dimensions. But he proved that under less restrictive conditions, a three-dimensional rounding always exists. 
Last, Larry also applied linear programming to the problem of maximizing or minimizing the overlap of primary sampling units, sometimes abbreviated PSUs, from one sample selection to the next. These were important problems. For example, in a survey, when we select a new set of counties, we might want to select many of the same counties because we already have field interviewers hired and trained in the old counties. This can save money and maintain the quality of the, op quality of the operations and data collected. But in other situations of surveys, we may want to minimize the overlap from one sample selection to the next. In either case, the problem is to maximize or minimize the number of PSUs in com common, but still maintain the prescribed probabilities of selection. The problem of maximizing overlap has been explored for decades under various conditions, such as whether or not the stratum definitions change, whether or not the selection probabilities within a stratum change, and whether we're selecting one PSU per stratum or more than one. Prior researchers provided proofs of optimality under simpler conditions. Sometimes they pr produce algorithms under complex conditions, but without a guarantee of optimality. In the early 1980s, Larry Ernst and Larry Cox provided a straightforward procedure that was optimal and worked with any new stratum definitions, any stratum selection probabilities, and any desired number of PSUs. Throughout his career, Larry returned to other aspects of maximizing and minimizing overlap. Before continuing, I should say a word or two about Larry himself. Larry earned his BS and PhD from the City College of New York and Brown University, respectively, both in mathematics. He was one of the best at applying his mathematical skills to solve real survey problems. He could understand a problem almost immediately and had a keen sense of the best path to a solution. It seems he had other keen senses as well. Rumor had it that he could smell a birthday cake or a pizza lunch three quarters away and that he never missed one. He did have a good appetite, and I recall meeting in his office in the winter time. The window would be wide open, middle of winter, maybe 40 degrees in there. I'd walk in wearing a sweater and a heavy sport coat. He'd be wearing a short sleeve dress shirt and a tie. But to his employees, Larry was a champion of their development. He always supported advancing their careers, and he made sure that his staff got credit for their discoveries and contributions. So let me turn to the second prominent area of Larry's research while at the Census Bureau. This involves the current population survey, CPS for short, which measures the labor force and its characteristics in the US, and maybe the first recurring government survey that used probability sampling. Larry made a variety of contributions to the CPS, many involving its rotating sample design. He researched the optimal linear composite estimator to take advantage of that design. Later, when BLS planned to institute a new questionnaire in January 1994, the question arose, what should we do about the composite estimator? Should we composite estimates based on data collected with the new and old questionnaires? Or should we begin a new series in January? Or perhaps something in between? Larry and I investigated the pros and cons of the options and made a recommendation which was approved and implemented. In the early 1990s, Larry had an idea to make life easier for users of CPS data. Composite estimates are difficult to work with for data users. To produce one, you have to combine this month's weighted estimate with last month's composite estimate and repeat that computation over several prior months. To avoid this, Larry suggested we develop one set of composite weights different for each new month that would be applied to any characteristic summed over the sample and would produce the composite estimate. This approach entailed controlling the final sample weights to a well-chosen set of composite estimates and applying an additional dimension of iterative proportion fitting. Around this time, Larry left the Bureau, but he encouraged a team of us from BLS and the Census Bureau to continue the project and he provided valuable consult consultation throughout. After several years of developing and testing, the concept was incorporated. Now, a data user can apply the composite weights directly to any set of characteristics to obtain a new composite estimate 
without having to composite over the estimates from the prior months. Larry didn't work on the team, but he came up with the idea and was a strong advocate for its completion. These are just a few of the many contributions that Larry made to surveys and survey methods during his half career at the Census Bureau. It was a pleasure working with him. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. That, uh, impressive litany. Very, very nice to hear all that. Be reminded of all, all that he did. Very good. Does anyone have questions? For Pat? So um, <clears throat> let's then uh, turn to the uh, sec second half of Larry's career, which already has been alluded to. Uh, uh, Steve Cohen will, will d d d discuss that. He, uh, b before I read Steve's biography, uh, I believe Steve was the instigator, uh, the, the catalyst that brought uh, Larry Ernst that uh, kidnapped him from the Census Bureau to BLS. Uh, uh, I can remember the day that uh, Larry arrived at BLS and Steve brought him around to introduce him to people and we were discussing some project and he immediately had some suggestions as I recall. <laughs> and anyway, Steve received his PhD from Rensselaer uh, in math, specialization, specialization in statistics and operations research. He has over 45 years of experience in the United States statistical system. He has our sympathy, including over 38 years in various positions at the Bureau of Labor Statistics, where he worked directly with Larry. Uh, and I'll, since that, that phone is being uh, being a nuisance, let me cut off the biography for, for the moment. We can recapitulate later and turn it over to Steve. I'm going to mute myself. Thank you, Alan. Uh, I'm going to pick up uh, where Pat left off. I'm going to cover uh, Larry's BLS career very briefly. Uh, I worked extensively with Larry when he was at BLS in the compensation program. Uh, my bottom line uh, it reflects a lot of what Pat just said. Uh, Larry was a valuable addition to the Office of Compensation and the Office of Survey Research over his 15 plus years at BLS. Uh, I'm kind of going roughly a memory on the 15 years because I don't have actual access to BLS records. Uh, it's more my memory. Uh, he helped adding statistical research capability that was somewhat lacking in the compensation program. Uh, I knew about Larry's research, as Pat talked about at the Census Bureau, on re-identification of data and his general excellent reputation. When I heard he wanted to make a, a career change uh, coming to BLS, I pursued it. Uh, I headed the statistical methods group at the BLS Office of Compensation at the time, and I knew I needed an accomplished researcher to expand, to support the expanded uh, research program as I concentrated on coordinations with the program office, IT, field collection procedures, all of which needed modernization. And I couldn't spend the time I really needed to spend on sample redesign. Valerie was really very valuable and had major implications on the redesign of the compensation programs. Uh, a little background of how I was able, how Larry fit in. Uh, I created a research staff uh, under Larry using expanded funding we got for major enhancement to the compensation program in the 90s uh, to support uh, federal salary adjustment. The funding increased the sample and we redesigned the whole package of compensation programs. The group also included a re-interview staff uh, to support independent analysis of the quality of the data. The reunion staff contacted respondents independently to verify data elements that we selected on a rotating basis. Larry recruited some great junior statisticians to support research on designing the program. And as Pat said, he never took credit for what they did and he always pushed that they get uh, visibility for their products. Uh, he encouraged the existing staff uh, to move away from brute force sampling to actually think about developing sophisticated sampling programs. Again, as part of my push to modernize the compensation program, to emphasize the use of technology as over a calculator. Uh, his research 
uh, he supported a tremendous amount of research. Many of the app are applications of what Pat mentioned he developed at the Census Bureau. I want to highlight just three uh, that he developed, but the list could go on and on and on. The first thing he worked on was creating a longitudinal panel out of the National Compensation Survey, uh, which was an area-based sample. That was the area-based sample we developed when we put all the programs together and had an enhanced sample design. How do you rotate out sample members and rotate in the sample members to keep the sample current? He spent a lot of effort on the nuances of all the difficulties that you have to do to handle that. Uh, for the interview program I just alluded to, uh, he worked on developing useful reports on the quality of the, re of the data that field reps were collecting. One of the more interesting things on one of the programs, it was accused of being soft data, not hard data. But for the re-interview program, we at least could validate that if it is soft data, the respondents can recreate it and they don't come off with wildly different estimates from the two data collections. And I think that was kind of an important contribution to help support that that's useful data. And the other thing he did was uh, involved in redesigning the National Compensation Survey as a reflecting the new census counts. The compensation survey areas were picked based on population. And as everybody knows, when new population counts come out, uh, there's an effort to reproduce the areas that go into our sampling frames. Uh, an example of that, he, come up with, he came up with a paper, which he published with some of the staff that he hired, use of overlap maximization in the redesign of the National Compensation Survey. Uh, th this was done, of course, with researchers that he hired. Uh, he all, and one of the things I always admired about Larry is his coming up with innovation solutions to problems that I asked him to look at. Uh, he paid careful attention to the detail and presented subtle problems to me uh, that I really didn't have the time to concentrate on. One example was in one of our wage publications uh, for labor markets, we published quartiles, uh, the 10th, 25th, 50th, 75th, and 90th quartile. And in one of the areas, by publishing that, if you knew something about the geographic area, and I'm not going to say what the geographic area was, although the data we're talking about something was 20 years ago, uh, you knew we were publishing rates of a particular company. And of course, that is a confidentiality by a problem big time. Uh, several years later, I moved on to uh, the I'm director of the Mathematical Research Center in the Office of Survey Methods Research. Larry applied for a senior level position in OSMR. And during that time, I wasn't Larry's direct supervisor, but he always made time for me when I wanted to discuss a problem. Uh, he would be able to get right on to the, get onto the nuance of the problem, give me advice. And he didn't just stop there. Uh, he would quite often come back a week or two later and said he thought about it some more and I should consider these things or I should think about going on this approach. Uh, uh, while he was in OSMR, he also continued to support the junior researchers in the statistical methods group. Again, I really enjoyed working with Larry. He was a tremendous intellect. Uh, he never, I could never come up with a problem he wasn't able to figure out. He might not know it instantly, but he would figure it out. Uh, as I said, I started. He was a great resource to BLS in the 15 plus years he was at BLS and a loss to census, although I know we still contributed somewhat to census. Thank you. Th thank you, Steve. That uh, brings many, many reminiscences back. That's very, very nice. Uh, so does anyone have questions for Steve or on reflection, Pat? <laughs> uh, If not, I'd like to uh, first uh, th th thanks thanks Steve for I, I believe he was the instigator of this uh, this session uh, it was his his brainchild and much appreciated very worthwhile to do. Uh, Larry's been gone from us uh, uh, se seven months now I think he died in November last year and uh, I'm sh sure uh, his wife Gail and his children. 
uh, Erica and Jason. I, I don't know if they're on, but if so, I hope that that this uh, this may, may, maybe um, fill them in, help them a little bit. Just how how broad and deep uh, Larry was. Uh, also, uh, <clears throat> would like like to uh, th thank Jeff Gonzalez who uh, d d did. Uh, uh, most of the organizing of this, getting the, the session, this web session together. Uh, and uh, does anyone else uh, want to say some final words before we uh, log off family or friends or anybody? Do I know how to do this? Can you hear me? No. Yes, we can hear you, Gil. Go. Turn on camera. Okay. I'd like to thank you for we can see you too. This and for talking about Larry, uh, I know bits and pieces. I don't know any of these details. I still don't understand the details, but I was always hearing things from the background. So thank you very much. And the um, Supreme Court decision from with a 1990 census with the apportionment of Montana, that was the one item in his career that he always talked about. And he was so pleased to be able to be part of that. Deservedly so. So thank you very much for doing this. Appreciate it. Glad you could be here, Gil. Oh, yes. And my children are there somewhere. They're, they're listening to. Hi, thank you. Yeah, I don't have too much to add. Um, I'm glad to hear about all these other things he worked on, because like my mom said, I knew about the Supreme Court but I couldn't have told you anything else specifically that he had worked on, so thank you. And this is Jason. Um, also just want to say thank you as well for organizing this. And it was nice to hear about his um, professional accomplishments. Thank, 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 thank you. Eric and Jason, thank you for speaking up. It's nice to be able to see you rather than just some old pictures. In your house. In your mom's I, house. We, I also we, have to say I, I appreciated your comments about the cold office because <laughs> I always complained about how cold our house was. So I <laughs> I did that work too. And I'm also not surprised he always knew when there was pizza and cake. <laughs> so <laughs> So we we married into the family. Erica's our daughter in law. And, um, you know, we were privileged to know Larry for many years, but you described a part of him that we didn't see. Um, and we very much appreciate getting to know him this so much better. Thank you. Thank you for doing this. What an honor. It was an honor to do this. So, Jeff, do you want to say anything about recording and availability or anything like that? So, um, uh, as you know, this session was recorded. Um, we are going through uh, the Washington Statistical Society is updating all its methodology program materials. Um, there will be a recording of this session um, uh, on the uh, Washington Statistical Society YouTube channel in the near future. So um, we'll send out a blast um, to the, the membership as, and um, I could send out uh, an email notification to the family when when that's available. Um, but it should be available in the, in the next uh, couple of months. Okay. Well, as chairman, uh, it was a privilege to to uh, to be part of this, and uh, I thank everybody for their participation. Uh, one, one and all. I have one last question: Who is who's put their name as Ada Lovelace on this? <laughs> Somebody that wants me to dog this, I guess. <laughs> We're trying to figure that out. So, all right. <laughs> I didn't even notice. 
Take care, everyone. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thanks a lot. Appreciate Thank it. You.